So what I'll do now is, as we're getting started, I'll give you a quick rundown of what we're doing tonight. Um, I'm Dominic. Uh, I'm the one that's been sending you all the emails. Uh, and I'll be running the Maker Jam over the next uh, week and a bit. Um, and I'll introduce you to all the different project uh, team as we go on through the night. Um, but tonight, so what we'll be doing is uh, I'll stop waffling soon. And then I'll hand over to Susie O'Hara, who's the One Cell at a Time curator. And she can tell you more about the project in general and about Human Cell Atlas. Um, then I'll talk a bit about the Maker Dam structure uh, and where this, give you some insight as to where this whole idea has come from. And then uh, uh, Susie will tell you a little bit about the talks and some of the uh, some of the associated activity that's happening throughout the week. There's some really exciting things coming up uh, via Zoom as well. Uh, and then I will uh, uh, introduce the producers for each of the artists uh, in the different regions, and then they will in turn tell you a bit about themselves and introduce the artists they've been working with. And then we'll wrap up by me just going through the Discord a little bit um, and talking about how we're going to use Discord uh to keep everything together discord's going to be the project glue it's going to be the main place that we communicate as we're going on through the week so i'm going to hand over if i can to um susie o'hara the one cell at a time project curator susie over to you thank you so much it's so nice to have this actually a reality it's been in the gestation and planning for a little while now so to have such a uh, diverse mix of people from such a wide geographical area joining us in this crazy experimental virtual Maker Jam is really very exciting. Um, thank you, Dominic. Uh, so yeah, as Dominic says, I'm the project manager and curator for One Cell at a Time. And welcome to all of you to our first virtual Maker Jam from donor to data. How very exciting that we're kicking it off. Um, so the Human Cell Atlas. Um, the Human Cell Atlas is an international research um, initiative that's aiming to map every cell type in the human body. And the body has over 37 trillion cells. And the HCA consortia is looking to create a human Google map, as it were, where researchers can zoom in to understand every human cell type um, across time from development to old age. So this work is awesome, it's incredible, and it will transform our understanding of biology and disease um, and could really revolutionize the way illnesses are diagnosed and treated. And this new knowledge of cellular mechanisms can lead to new diagnostics and treatments for, for illness and also transform future healthcare. It was co-founded as a project in 2016 by Dr. Sarah Teichman at the Wellcome Sanger Institute here in the UK in collaboration with Dr. Aviv Regeev. At that time, um, she was based at the Broad Institute in MIT and Harvard. So it's truly global, as is this Maker Jam, which is kind of incredible. Um, and within the HCA, there's over 2,000 members now from over 75 different countries. Um, so we're in a really interesting context, and I just wanted to lay that out a little bit. Um, what, what is One Cell at a Time? Well, One Cell at a Time explores the Human Cell Atlas through art and community-driven projects. And it's led by the Wellcome Sanger Institute, and it's funded by a research enrichment grant by the Wellcome Trust. Um, and it's designed to run parallel with the work of a consortium of six UK-based institutions um, that have collectively been funded by Wellcome through a Wellcome Strategic Support Science Award. And the aim of this award was really for the, these institutions, which include the Wellcome Sanger Institute, Cambridge University, EMBL, EBI in Cambridge, Newcastle University up here in the Northeast, where I'm based and Dominic's based, King's College in London, and also the University of Oxford. They're all come together really to start the process of creating reference maps for a range of different organs and tissue groups, including the gut, the skin, the lungs, amongst other. 
um, amongst other organs. And so the science of HCA is really current, it's currently been um, explored by a truly multidisciplinary community of biologists and clinicians and technologists, physicists, software engineers, mathematicians. And actually, some of whom are with us tonight and have you know, signed up to take part in the Maker Jam. So I'm incredibly delighted to welcome you here. Thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. Um, and really, we've chosen this format of a virtual Maker Jam to help expand that ecology of expertise to include artists and creatives and communities like you. So you are incredibly welcome as well. Thank you. And over the past year, the One Cell at a Time team, many of whom, most of whom are here, um, have been exploring key questions that drive the Human Cell Atlas initiative, namely, what does it mean to be normal? And this is a really pertinent question, particularly over the last year, but it's also one that our commissioned artists have been exploring in collaboration with their cultural producers, who you'll meet a little bit later on, across the UK, from a social and a cultural perspective. And you'll hear more about this actually on Saturday night as part of our talks program, which I'll tell you a little bit more about later on. But this question of normality is also really fundamental to the HCA science. Because the HCA is seeking to, to kind of create this Google map of, of healthy human cells, researchers need to understand what normality looks like in order to be able to identify disease. So it's a really interesting, gnarly question that we've been having lots of fun with over the last year. And you'll hear a little bit more about that, as I say, in, in the programme moving forward. But really, I suppose more, more specifically for the Maker Jam, the second question that we've been exploring is what influences people's value and trust in research involving tissue donation and open access data? And this relates specifically to the material that's required in order for the scientific research to progress. And this material is healthy human cells and data. And so over the next 10 days, we're interested in how we can collaboratively devise creative ways to help communities, the public, ourselves, you know, explore the science of HCA through our artist challenges, which you're gonna hear about a little bit later on in this session, and your own creative talent. And what I'm supposed, I, I think what I'm interested in is how we can open a space to kind of explore some of the sensitivities that surround public perception of tissue and data donation and how those the sensitivities might and how we how can we address them. And so it's really through one cell at a time, which really I kind of I suppose has been a programme of talks and participatory art commissions, creative workshops, schools, challenges, this, this maker jam, and it's all going to culminate in a one cell at a time exhibition in November. Um, and what we've been hoping to do through this programme is to help build trust in scientific research by improving I suppose, awareness uh, and understanding of the kind of revolutionary impact projects such as the HCA can have on our understanding of biology and disease. And we really want to start to think through making and think through doing how we create space, safe space for people from different backgrounds and experiences to engage directly with science and scientists and start that conversation that could potentially identify areas of unmet need that the project like HCA can take forward in future initiatives. So ultimately by bringing together art and science and communities from across the UK and now the world, you know, what we want to do is bring about a cultural shift towards enhanced and sustained engagement with the Human Cell Atlas across research and diverse communities who will benefit from the positive impact that this science research will potentially generate in people's lives and that's the rationale for why we're here today that's the rationale for why we've got this incredible team of artists and producers and now this ecology of creatives and um and maker jammers in this space uh, and i just want to welcome you all and say thank you so much for joining us thanks susie oh, just uh, punch my microphone there um so um, what is the Maker Jam? Well, uh, I'm going to tell you in a second, but one thing I realized I forgot to tell you when we started was that for anybody who needs uh, subtitles and closed captions, 
We have those available at the bottom of the screen. So just click on closed captions and select subtitles from the little uh, downward triangle that pops up when you do that. Um, I know I find them useful. I'm going to start sharing my screen if that is going to work. So I'll just give me a second. Um, and I will start my presentation. And I need to flip the display settings. And now you should just have the main uh, slide window. Uh, is that correct, Susie? That's correct. Brilliant. It's always a worry that you're going to see my presenter notes. That's always like the presenter's worst nightmare. So um, the Maker Jam. Uh, the Maker Jam uh, comes about uh, as a result of uh, what we were, well, what we were originally going to do when uh, this whole project started it was uh, it was devised before COVID. Believe it or not, it was devised a long time ago, uh, and then the world changed for all of us. Uh, what we had intended to do was to actually go and run some physical hackathons, some makeathons, uh, in each region, which would have been great, and it would have been really nice to actually come down and meet you and. Uh, have uh, days exciting making with everybody. But that wasn't possible, as it turned out. And uh, we had to rethink how we were going to do this. Uh, so we, we kind of looked at different sprint methodologies. Because um, uh, when you think about it, a hackathon is one type of sprint method. It's one way of doing things really fast. So we started looking at some of the other ones as well. Um, we kind of thought about kind of the, the nature of them, whether they are the, whether we run them in the truest sense, like over 24 hours and uh, lock people in a room and feed them pizza uh, and kind of deprive them of uh, fresh air and daylight, or um, whether we kind of take a slightly different approach as well. Um, but hackathons have a really useful uh, place within making uh, and, and arts uh, methods and that they can kind of that high intensity that that kind of uh, intense moment where lots of people disparate with different dis disparate skill sets come together uh, in a short period of time often quite innovative uh, and engaging things can come from that um, but there are other types of sprints there's uh, one type of sprint that I particularly enjoy taking part in is a book sprint so um, book sprints are uh, very similar, but um, everybody will break up into different skill sets. So you'll come up with the uh, the theme for the book. And it's often, uh, it started life, Book Sprint started life originally as a way of writing software manuals for uh, open source software, I think, because uh, uh, because that was the last thing that was uh, available. You know, software, open source and free software can be brilliant, but there was very little information on how to actually use a lot of it. So um, I think it was Adam Hyde devised the book sprint methodology as a way of writing software manuals. And then it was adopted uh, by lots of other people for lots of other processes. Uh, and it's a point at which somebody will become a writer or a group of people will be the writer. They will have editors there who are often sit, literally sitting looking over the writer's shoulder as they're typing, which can be a bit stressful. And you'll have all the kind of the illustrators and the person who's laying it out and all the different ro roles that would be involved in the process of uh, publishing a book are there, but in, active within a very short space of time. Um, you get editathons as well, and these are um, often uh, people getting together to edit uh, Wikipedia um, and uh, add information about often underrepresented groups of people. And um, something that I really enjoy taking part in also is a, a game jam. And that's kind of what we've borrowed some of the method from for this as well and the um, game jams uh, can take place in the in the real world uh, with people sitting around with the laptops drinking coffee in in rooms um, but increasingly actually thanks to platforms like itch uh, game jams are happening over a longer period of time over the, say, over the course of a week or two uh, with people coming together uh, online who've never met before and sharing skills and sharing processes and developing uh, a game together. Um, and uh, often the Discord platform is used for that as well, because uh, the Discord platform was originally devised as a, as a way of communicating 
if a game is to communicate while we're playing things like Call of Duty and various other exciting games like that. So um, we've kind of borrowed a lot of uh, the time dilation for this project from the kind of way game jams are structured as well. If you ever get the chance to take part in a game jam, I really actually recommend it. It's a lot of fun. Um, so what is the Maker Jam then? Well, the Maker Jam is an online event. It's a one day maker event spread out over the course of a week. Now it's been really hard to try and explain this, uh, to find the kind of the right language to kind of help people understand that there's no expectation that you spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week on this project. Um, inevitably one or two people will get excited and, and give the project a, a fair bit of time, but that's not what our expectation is of you. We spread it out over a week so that you could give it, you could fit it in with your busy lives, so you could fit it into your days. Uh, we did at one point think, should we just run this as 24 hours and see what happens? But actually, um, we wanted as many people to participate in this as we could, because we wanted to meet as many people as we could. So we spread it out over a week and you know, chip away at something, join in when you've got time. Um, there will be four challenges, uh, one for each artist commission, and the artists will talk about that shortly as well. Um, you might have seen them, uh, more information about them popping up in the Discord today. Uh, there'll be uh, stream talks and get-togethers uh, that include presentations on aspects of the Human Cell Atlas project, lab presentations, and artist talks over Zoom. All the links and all the signups for the Zooms are in the shared public schedule. And um, please shout if you still haven't got access to that. We've sent it out in emails and it's on the Discord, etc. But you know, let me know if you haven't got it, because that's like the cornerstone, that's the touchstone. That's where everything that you need is. It's got all of the um, times that you'll be able to meet the artists in it. And it's got links to all of the Zooms that are happening as well. So if you've got that information, it's a bit like the, uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You've got everything you need at that point. I can't believe I made such a nerdy reference already, and it's only the start of the project. I'm really sorry. Um, so there will be regular check-ins with artists on Discord uh, via each artist's channel, and I'll show you a bit more about how we're going to do this in Discord shortly. Uh, these will occur in the evening at 6.30 p.m., uh, which is where each artist will be able to talk about their work and your responses to the challenges and be able to offer you some help and support as you go on as well. Uh, there'll be ongoing chat and support and team building and making uh, all and, and making that will all be shared on the Maker Jam Discord. And a lot of, I can imagine a lot of communication as it often is, will be in the general channel. Um, but once you get into the nitty gritty of your the artist challenges, we'll move them over to the individual channels. And then when we get to Friday the 18th next week, um, We'll all be best friends. We'll all have kind of been through an amazing ordeal together and we will have the grand finale, which will be a kind of uh, show and tell Zoom sharing party. Um, slightly less formal than this. And um, if you signed up in time to get bunting, please put your bunting up as well. I'd love to see it as well. So the ways of joining in, uh, just to be really clear as well, are. Um, to join the Discord platform. So if you if you're in uh, this chat, if you're in the Zoom now, hello, oh, Justine. Sorry. Hi. Uh, it looks like the slide is cut for quite a few of us, so you might is need it? to reshare a bit. Yeah. Oh no. Well, thank uh, you for letting me know. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Is that okay now? Yeah. Thanks, Justine. Um. So uh, ways of joining in. Uh, as I was just saying, uh, the join the Discord platform. If you're in this Zoom now and you're going, what's Zoom, what's Discord? Then stick around at the end and I'll help you kind of figure that out. Um, you can get a swag bag if you signed up in time. Um, I'm about to do a second drop on that uh, with some snacks and refreshments. Uh, that's gonna be UK only, I'm afraid, because I'm slightly nervous about posting tea bags to America. I've never done it before. I don't know what happens when tea bags go through customs. Maybe, maybe I'm being a wimp. I don't know, but uh, uh, sorry, no tea bags, America. Um, you can uh, join or form a team around a challenge as well. You'll see in the Discord there's an opportunity to do that. 
Um, you can develop an idea, make something, contribute code, writing, crafting. Uh, you can make some visual art. It's everything, any idea you have around this, as long as nobody gets hurt or offended is valid. Uh, so, you know, don't worry too much about what that is. Just enjoy yourself and uh, enjoy using the making, ma making of something as a way to engage with the artist and a way to engage with the subject matter. Um, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to, which is don't worry too much about finishing in time. It's just going to be fun to kind of be making things with you. Um, and uh, well, I'll be just as interested in, for want of a better term, the heroic failures that we kind of find out about at the at the grand finale as I will in the kind of, uh, you know, if somebody invents Twitter or something like that, which would be great as well, obviously. But, um, you know, it's all about kind of enjoyment as well. So don't worry, don't feel stressed, don't panic about deadlines, don't have sleepless nights because then you'll give me sleepless nights. So just let's all kind of take it easy and enjoy ourselves. Um, if you don't want to make things and you just want to find out what's happening, that is also absolutely fine. Watch the talks and join in the discussion. Uh, join in on social media, cheer people on who are making things, you know, um, be, be a project champion. Um, yeah, join the main Discord chat and just be, become a project friend. Um, visit the associated websites, learn more about the HCA project in general as well as part of that participation. Um, I will kind of stop sharing my screen now um, and uh, yeah, so that is the, um, the general kind of ethos of the, um, the Maker Jam. It is a, a fun project, it's enjoyable. We've never done this before. Uh, we are kind of, it's always a bit scary when somebody who's running a project says they're learning about the project while they're delivering it. Um, but, you know, to be honest with you, we are. Um, we're trying to be uh, super professional and organized because there's a lot of super professional and organized people who are involved in this project. Um, but we also want to become uh, part of the overall Make a Jam experience for you as well. So we'll be figuring things out. And if there's ways we can do this better as we go on, we'd really absolutely love to hear what you, what you think as well as we go on to, to be able to make this a good experience for everybody. So that's a Make a Jam in a nutshell. There'll be a bit more about uh, from me later on about the actual mechanics of it and, and where to go and what to say and, and who to meet at various points in time. But for now, I'll just pass over to Susie to tell who's going to tell you a little bit about uh, the Maker Jam talks and the lunchtime labs as well. So uh, over to you, Susie. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Um... Okay, I'm just going to see if I can share my screen. Here's where my professionalism is, is ex, you know, ex, a shining example to you all. Hold on to your seconds. Um, and I did it. How very exciting. Okay. So, um, as part of the Maker Jam, what I what what we felt was going to be useful was was maybe hosting a series of opportunities for you guys to kind of delve a little bit more into the science of the HCA and connect with the researchers and some of the themes and topics, some of the complexities and nuances that this kind of science at this scale, with this kind of transformative potential, um, to. Uh, and, and what we decided to do was to kind of host a range of different talks that brought really interesting people to your personal homes, because we're probably all zooming in from our personal homes at the moment. Um, and so I've, we've, I've kind of devised a series of different talks. Um, we started off yesterday with an incredible conversation between um, Krishna uh, Muhababi and Ulm Halm Og, who are both um, professor and uh, study lead at, at Oxford and Cambridge, respectively, alongside Aaron Katz and Gina 
Zarnecki, who are artists who use um, tissue to create their artworks. And it was called um, Donating Ourselves Ourselves. And it's available now as a recording. We were swift and quick off the mark to get it onto the HCA YouTube channel for anybody who wasn't able to make it to be able to view at your leisure. So we've got that available to you. And that's um, that's a kind of a really interesting watch. And I would definitely encourage you guys to, to take the time if you've got it to, to kind of listen to that resource. As Dominic said, um, you know, we're now on the, the, the Maker Jam launch evening. Um, and over the week, we've kind of dropped in some really nice opportunities for you guys to uh, touch base with some of the scientists who are essentially on the coalface in the labs doing the research. So we've invited Hanifa Lab in Newcastle University. There's about five different researchers, postdoctoral researchers um, as well to, to talk about what they're doing. So this is going to be an hour lunchtime kind of um, opportunity to get some really kind of five minute snapshots of what scientists in the labs are doing in the Hanif lab in, in the University of Newcastle. Um, and as I said, it's just something to zoom into over your lunch break um, and, and connect with the guys who are, who are really just doing the, doing the work um, uh, at the moment as part of their, as part of the HCA project. Um, I've invited the artists who you're, you're going to hear about now um, in terms of their challenges. So we've got four artists and artist groups, um, artist duos, who have been commissioned um, as part of the Human Cell Atlas One Cell at a Time programme and have been working with communities um, with the support of their cultural producers over since October. And so they've done incredible work um, exploring this notion of normality and exploring kind of the issues and complexities around donation um, in, for, for projects um, such as these. Um, and this is going to be a, a quite an informal but roundtable discussion that explores some of their experiences, really, of working in the context of HCA. Um, so if you want to know a little bit more about the artists and their work, their particular approaches, and the really interesting um, kind of ways that they've been able to connect and engage with diverse communities in Newcastle and Oxford and London and Cambridge in the middle of the pandemic, primarily online and um you know come along and join that discussion i think it's going to be i think it's going to be really lovely actually i think it's going to be a really interesting conversation to to be part of and to listen to um we've got the european bioinformatics institute which is uh, shortened to ebi um hosting on monday again another lunchtime lecture and i think we've got about three or four different researchers there much more from the data side and the data wrangling side talking about how they manage the sheer volume of research data that's emerging from this project and we'll talk a little bit about the infrastructure that they are coordinating from that side but also some of the research that's happening in that space which i think that's going to be really interesting and we're going to finish the talks program on wednesday the 16th with another art size salon which is about bringing artists and scientists together on the same panel and this is called from Don donor to open data and we've got um, two researchers, one from EBI and one from the Sanger Institute. One is a data wrangler um, and the, the second, Elo Madison, is, is um, on the research side and really generating new knowledge from the data that's been generated by the Human Cell Atlas, identifying these cell types. It's incredible work that she's doing. And we're bringing in two artists, Judy Freeman and Daniel, Daniel Kanager, who are generative artists, generative data-based artists, but also um, Julie is a fascinating artist who's been using data and open data for, for many years, creating really interesting work um, in that space as well. Um, and it's really just about kind of, you know, offering an opportunity, I'll just stop sharing my, my screen here, for you guys to delve a little bit deeper into the world that we've been playing in over the last year or so from an artistic perspective, um, and to be able to kind of directly connect with some of the people who are on the co-face, both on the art and the science side, to get, you know, give you some space to, hear about the, the work that's happening, listen to some really interesting ideas, have a space to ask some questions um, and get involved. So I hope you're able to, to join us if you can. Thank you. Thanks, Susie. Um, yeah, it's going to be really exciting. Um, so 
this takes us to the uh, to the really exciting part of this presentation, which is uh, the, the artist presentations and the artist challenges. Um, so we we've got about twenty minutes per uh, producer and uh, artist to kind of find out about their project uh, and find out about their challenges. This is really important for you. This is a bit you really need to be kind of tuned into and paying attention to. This is where you find out which challenge you would like to take part in. Um, so have a listen, have a think, decide which group you want to be part of or which, yeah, no pressure, Matt. Uh, I'm just reading the chat at the same time because uh, I can do that now. Um, uh, so have a listen, no pressure. Choose your artist carefully. I would say you can change your mind if you start on a project, uh, but don't change your mind uh, and, and let anybody uh, down if you joined a team I would say be kind of decent as well and kind of try and give I would say like there's a 24 hour grace period at the start of the project where you can kind of like jump ship and join a different project after that you're probably going to kind of be getting into deep water so you know uh, choose your eyes carefully they're all very exciting I don't know which project I would actually choose I'd be kind of a social butterfly Flitting between, with actually technically, I think that's my job this week, so that's great. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm going to start. I'll hand over to Matt to introduce himself, and then for Matt to introduce Anna. So, over to you, Matt. Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Matt. I'm artistic director and chief exec of uh, Cambridge Junction in my day job, uh, and working as creative producer, community engagement. Uh, with Anna McDonald, uh, who is a dance and film artist. I'll say that. I, I, Anna will give a be much better description of that. Um, we've had a fascinating process, as Susie said, working uh, in lockdown has never been easy. Anna and I have never actually met in person, um, which is um, the first time I think that's ever happened in any artist collaboration that I've ever done ever. Uh, I'm, very, I'm coming up to Manchester in a few weeks though, Anna. I'd love to have a drink. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's been a fascinating process. Um, we are exploring performing normalities, our, our umbrella uh, title, and we have been exploring that as uh, as an abstract and as a specific, I suppose. And I think uh, we it has been a very iterative process for us, um, encountering things ourselves in our conversations and in the groups that we've been working with, which have then fed into the next stage of the project with other groups that we've been working with. So Anna, will, uh, Anna shall I, I won't steal your thunder, are you going to talk about the specifics or shall I just do a little? You can steal, I don't mind. But working with, um, so we were thinking about giving and receiving and thinking about uh, the process of donating tissue and how important tissue donation is to the Human Cell Atlas Project. They need tissue in order to um, get into the uh, nitty gritty of our cells. And um, so we started thinking about giving and receiving and through that thinking about also about those people who are receiving uh, things that are donated. So um, Anna's been working with a group of donor recipients and through that we also started thinking about giving and receiving care and so have been um, working with a group of young carers with a group called Centre 33 in Finland which was our, our target, target geography if you like for the project in terms of demographic. Uh, and uh, the other sort of larger workshop that we did was delivered uh, by the donor recipients to their um, their invited friends and family um, because we were really interested in um, something that one of the HCA members that we met said about the quality of telling stories um, in a very personal one-to-one -one, um, way. So we were really interested in how the donor recipients would translate the research in their own language, in their own poetry, in their own imagery and communicate that to their uh, friends and family. So through that, all of that, we have come to um, something which is around matching. And we've been very interested in, in that sort of communication of of movement through, through Zoom. I, I, I was just going to tilt my screen. I've got so used to tilting my screen to show this off. Uh, but um, I'll, I'll leave that to Anna. So on, on that, um, I'll hand you over to Anna McDonald, who will um, tell you much more. 
Okay, thanks, Matt. You have totally stolen my thunder, but that's all right. So I'll find, <laughs> I'll find, I'll find some more. You told me to. Yeah, yeah, no, I did. I did say that, didn't I? Let me just um, try that again because that's not shared. I've got some images for you. There we go. Can you see a lady lifting up her hands? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Super. Let me make her bigger. Um. Yeah, so as Matt said, so I'm a dance and uh, I mean, I, I call it moving image, but yeah, it's essentially film artist. And I work with very simple movements, um, but exploring the resonance of them. So movements, so from like holding or slowing down or moving from here to there. So um, movement that's kind of fundamental to lots of, um, big ideas really um, and I show my work in festivals and film festival settings um, work with I specialize in working with the public um, work with lots of different publics of different sizes in different contexts sometimes that's cited working in public spaces sometimes that's in galleries and sometimes, like this one, I don't use bodies at all, but it's really about the movement of A to B or down to up. Or the movement through systems. So this is a diagram of a research health protocol system. So it's looking at very linear causal. If you get to that point, then you go to the next point. If you get to this point, then you stop there. So, um, yeah, I'm interested in movement in a really, in a really broad sense. And um, uh, a year or two ago, I, I got a, a fellowship at Kiel, an arts fellowship at Kiel, to look at the relationship of movement and time and effect, so that the felt sense of the body and how that connects to time, our felt sense of time. And then um, my research at the moment is looking at digital witnessing, so um, how being seen or the sense of being seen, the felt sense of being seen, um, affects us, and that's um, funded by Arts Council. So one of the things I'm really interested in is, is that felt sense of the body, and in, in I see a few dancers here, I recognise the fringes, um, you know, it's in, in somatics, you know, we talk about somatics, we're looking not so much at the external shapes that the body makes, but more how it feels to move and um, that kind of intense sensation that movement can produce. And uh, yes, yeah, so I'm not I'm not a coder or a digital artist in that sense, but I'm really interested in quite sort of simple, how very simple digital processes can produce big somatic effects. So um, how the very simple thing of how uh, I can move across a trackpad and that can create a shape on the screen. And that to me is still a source of, of absolute wonder that that one thing can create another thing and how that relationship between the cause and effect affects the way my sense of being in the world, my sense of having agency. And I'm really interested in that, the levels of responsivity. So how very fine or very robust that kind of um, settings might be between my action and the thing that happens. I was interested a few years ago, I was working with a, a mocap team for a while and we spent an awfully long time um, finding out what my sense of stillness was and what their sensor's sense of stillness was. Because of course, when I felt I was still, they were registering huge amounts of movement in the body. And I was really fascinated to see where different people's sense of stillness, how that calibrated. So yeah, kind of quite quite simple things in some way, but um, yeah, with big felt sense um, from people involved in it. So as Matt said, uh, yeah, we've been interested in what it is to give and what it is to receive and why we might do either of those things. And one of the things that came up very quickly from working with um, organ donor, um, organ, organ recipients and young carers is 
the importance of matching. Uh, matching um, in the sense of waiting to be matched, the, the wonder of finding a match, the uh, extraordinary sense of feeling seen that you might get when you're matched with another or even like affirming a sense of self, you know, the, the fact that your hands fit the shape of your skull or a load of washing fits in a washing basket, which fits the number of pegs that come in a pack that fits the washing line they send with it. You know, like those sort of uh, extraordinary matches that we find um, in every day. I'm, yeah, so I'm really thinking about matching as a way of feeling seen. And there's obviously with, you know, digital processes, matching is a, is a massive part of that. And, um, you have some real kind of horrors, you know, some real Google lens sort of matches, which can make you feel a bit dead inside um, and, and dead on the outside, apparently, according to my 52% match that I got with, um, this is the Google Arts and Culture app. I'd, I'd recommend people using it, or maybe not if you're feeling low on self-esteem, maybe don't go near that one. Um, but how disappointing it can feel when a shape you offer a shape and then another shape is immediately offered back to you. And you really feel like you're just at the mercy of an algorithm and you could be anywhere and uh, there is no God. And this machine is not thinking about you and you don't have a special place in the universe. Um, it's just something looks a bit like something else. Uh, and there's something so different in that process to me than a sense of affinity with something else, a, a connection with something else. Uh, so I'm really interested in how we can find a more effective sense of matching something which has that wonder, that wonder of uh, the romance, I suppose, of seeing something else uh, in the world that you think is a bit like you or they think they're a bit like you and, and we find something. So matching obviously in the research culture for hca they're looking for close matches they're looking for correlations and connections and that's a huge part of their research you know uh, for the transplant recipients they're living with the real danger of not finding a match or with the responsibility of having been matched and, and what that the implications of that so we've been working a lot with movement and i'll just um show you a little no it's not little it's just short I keep using the word little but it's not we've been you know using movement because obviously with choreography choreography there's pretty there's not really much else to it apart from things that are sort of the same or they're not the same there is more to it and forgive the dancers in the room again but like fundamentally you're always looking for that are we moving at the same time together are we doing the same actions but with different qualities or at different times or so all the time you're looking for that together and apart and I'm very interested in close matches things that are similar but not the same so let me share you something else Hold on. there you go
one of the things that I keep remembering is the line from John's poem about pondering what wasn't said, you know? It, I, I thought that and the repetition of something being the same when you're in hospital, the same, the same, the same. And then by contrast, the not matching and not matching things and um, and the candlesticks for me when you were saying that they're the one of the few things you have that's matching something that somebody's given you. And it occurred to me that the only I looked around the house and the only thing that we have that's matching are also candlesticks that somebody gave us for our wedding because we did a a um, candle ceremony. We did a non a humanist ceremony, you lit two candles into one kind of thing. And we had to have um yeah, we had to have candlesticks so but that idea of the only other thing that I have that's matching is my heart because it was matched to me by somebody else and it, that kind of had been playing with my head and it struck me when I was looking at the candles <coughs> again that it's quite interesting so they're kind of yeah and what's yeah yeah And that's Angela speaking there, who's one of the organ donor uh, recipients. So, um, yeah, my challenge is, um, I'm going to read this because uh, it sounds clear, is to explore the potential technologies for matching and different processes of searching. So I'm really interested in scrolling and tracking and reading and sifting and pattern matching and to explore what might be matched with what so is it can we locate patterns that match by different senses can we match the quality of a hand gesture to a particular species of tree or is there a way of revealing patterns that are not visual such as two people thinking the same thing at the same time thanks Thanks, Anna. That was brilliant. I really enjoyed that. Um, I'm just going to kind of just keep moving forward. Um, but that was that was brilliant. Um, but next, we're going to move on to Cambridge. Not we've just had Cambridge. So that was a test. Well done. I can see by your face you passed. We're going to move on to Oxford, <laughs> uh, and I'll introduce Catherine, who's going to introduce her artists. Uh, Catherine, are you there? Yes, I am. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm struggling with back pain still, so uh, I just switch off the camera to stretch out. But um, uh, super happy to see you all. Um, my name is Catherine. I'm with Fusion Arts, uh, based in East Oxford, the heart of East Oxford, from where we deliver um, a great <laughs> annual program. Um, let me just check. Um, sorry. Um, yes, <laughs> we create um, artistic experiences, uh, building skills, combating disadvantage um, and promoting community cohesion. We have been uh, commissioned in this, oh, not challenge, um, we have been partner in this program, uh, assisting Vicky and Paul, um, aka Boredom Research, on their collaboration with uh, the scientists, the Oxford-based community groups, um, working on the Human Cell Atlas projects. We um, have been involved um, in helping to set up and deliver computer art workshops with uh, Boredom Research, with Oxford uh, City College and EMBS College um, to get um, some meaningful engagement going between the public and the scientific domain. Um, and we're looking forward to support further in the um, in the artwork, um, which is going to be a movie. I don't really don't want to say too much about what we're going to do. So I just uh, don't know if Vicky and Paul want to uh, introduce themselves because yeah, that's fine with us. Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't quite sure how much I should say <laughs> because I know that you um, that you had prepared such a great video. Okay, so yeah, thank you, Catherine. Yeah, well, we'll talk about us now. Yeah, 
Um, yeah, no, it's been really great working with fusion arts and, and we've done like quite a few workshops, which... Can everyone, um, can everyone hear us okay? Yeah, can everyone hear us okay? Yeah. Um, with, as, as um, actually I'm going to share my screen. Let's, let's start there. Okay. Okay, so hopefully you'll be able to see um, a slide of some cells. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Okay. Um, so yeah, just a bit of background about us. Um, we've been working collectively as Boredom Research for over 20 years now. A lifetime. <laughs> Uh, and we're still together, so it can't be so bad. <laughs> um, and um, we produce, like, um, our, our work is quite diverse. Um, so we're just going to show you some slides to kind of give you a range of um, work that we've been working on. Predominantly over the last six years, we've been um, collaborating with um, scientists. Um, and some of these are scientists that work in conservation and biomedical scientists, a whole range of different scientists worldwide, which has been phenomenal. Um, it's kind of really interesting to move back and forth between those two domains, you know, moving between kind of scientists working with the health of the planet and scientists working with the health of of the body and that's something that's been really interesting for us to start to to kind of see how those two worlds relate um to uh to each other yeah so one of the one of the things we do is we we kind of shadow scientists so obviously during this project we haven't really been able to do that physically which actually has been quite interesting so we've we've kind of engaged with the scientists a lot more through discussions and kind of interviews um, but this is us on the jurassic coast um and yeah, like one of the things we do is like kind of shadowing scientists and, and, and trying to get to know their kind of field work that they do, if they do field work. Um, and also we've worked with scientists um, that are lab based, um, both, it, both in computational labs, um, but like wet labs as well. Um, so here you can see us in Arizona. We were fortunate enough to go to the Biodesign Institute and work with Arizona Cancer and Evolution Center, which was phenomenal. Uh, so it was in residence there, um, learning a lot about their model organisms, um, that they have a lot of marine organisms there that they're looking at for studying cancer. So then I suppose the works that we create increasingly sort of they combine um, kind of material collected from the field, whether that's literally kind of samples that maybe we then kind of work with um, with the scientists or whether it's kind of just um, acquisition in terms of audio and film um, recordings. And then um, we combine those with um, animation and, and we kind of work with a number of animation tools like 3D animation software or, or game engines. And that allows us to also kind of incorporate um, what I suppose what scientists would call uh, si uh, a simulation, but we kind of refer to them as it, um, it expressions but they're pretty much the same thing we kind of we're interested in the in, in in ways of encoding the mechanics and the behaviors of systems and then kind of using those to create a visual um expression of that um of that system or 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 area of interest so you can kind of see here one of our keyboards that we've kind of built for camera control. So um, often we'll have these camera controls that we can fly through like a game engine and um you know, navigate that space as well. Um, so for this project, um, we've been working on a film, as Catherine said, um, which has come from a series of workshops. Um, and the title of our film is called Call of the Silent Cell. Um, and we've been collaborating with um, scientists from the Wellcome Center for Human Genetics. Um, and to develop the, primarily to start off with, to develop the narrative and the concept around the film. Um, so this film is, um, as you can see here, is about an old man and he enters the forest to find himself lost in a storm um, that brings a new perspective to his fa failing health. So, and that storm's not just any old storm. Not, not any it? old storm. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, uh, it's been. It was really interesting because when we first, um, when we first kind of um, found out that we were working with, um, I can't remember who who said this, but when we first found out that we were 
be working with scientists at Oxford, it was you know we was we was informed that they they uh, they work a lot on the um, intestines and gut bacteria. But you don't you know you, you don't have to. Um, there was a kind of a, um, um, a, 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 I suppose a little bit of of of, of of gut anxiety, maybe that yeah. that wouldn't be entirely suitable for uh, artistic um, expression, but we kind of completely went with that. And the film is kind of set in um, the intestines, but also in the forest as well. And, and and really, this kind of idea came from our conversations we had with um, uh, one of the scientists who was really interested in the relationship between um, my. Um, the microbes that inhabit our, our gut and the way they kind of affect the cells of the immune system. And, and, and this kind of brought together so many kind of interesting ideas about the relationship between the complexity that we experience in a natural context and the complexity um, and the richness that we have inside it of our own bodies, both in terms of kind of, you know, the complexities of those kind of cellular um, environments, but also the kind of in, the, the, the the interaction between those cellular environments and kind of microbial environments, which are very much, you know, very much kind of ecosystems, um, effectively. Um, so one of the things that's quite important in this work to us is to kind of bridge, um, like to kind of have create a more holistic way of thinking about reuniting concepts around biomedical health, but also um, environmental health. So that's why we've set it in a forest. Um, but eventually you kind of get to this um, cytokine storm, um, which is in the intestinal uh, tract. And it's made of these, well, we've got these villes, haven't we? Yeah, so, so maybe we should describe what a villet is. In, for, you're in, like, you're in intestines are covered with these tiny finger-like hairs called villi and um and um which uh, so we have a kind of a a, 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 um, a frame from the simulation um from the animation on on the slide there and then we've been building a simulation of a cytokine storm that then kind of will be um, enacted over the surface of those villes. So, and that really can be started developing that in a series of workshops um, that Catherine mentioned. So, yeah, um, so the workshops were with um, our target audience was teenagers. So, we were working with 16 to 18 year olds. Um, and we created this piece of software called Cyt Cytokine Storm so that the teenagers could create their own um, cells, but also their own environment environments and then run those assimilations. So they were quite simple. There was just four cell types um, that they could run in their simulation and just watch the different reactions that would play out. And and they also got to kind of take tissue samples as well, but using vegetables rather than on themselves. Um, we couldn't get clearance for that. Um, so uh, yeah, so this the um, I suppose we're kind of getting close to talking about the challenge, aren't we? So yeah um, so so just to give you a bit of insight obviously this work is still in process um so we're working on the simulation for the film um and this has been developed from the workshops that we did with the teenagers um so now we're creating like um animated texture maps that have been developed from um those kind of simulation those early simulations that we created with um the teenagers a lot of them didn't have any code experience so that was kind of interesting as well well. Um, so we're thinking about it a lot more visually. Um, and then, um, do you want to talk about this? Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so in, in the film that we're kind of, we're then kind of, um, we're, uh, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Right. So there's a C. If we go back, there's this like C of Ville. So our cytokine storm is like, it basically looks like C and you're kind of, the camera is moving through it. Um, and uh, the C is made out of these finger-like structures, which are the villi. Um, and then basically um, you see the cell signaling. So we're mapping that yeah. onto these villi. Um, like the simulations that we created earlier, but it's mapped through light. 
Um, yeah. So you get the different kind of reactions of healthy, infected, activator or killer cells. Yeah. So, the, I mean, the narrative arc of the film is it kind of starts in the forest and there's this idea of a brewing storm, but then um, there's this kind of little event that happens. We won't say too much about it. And then we kind of we move, move seamlessly inside the body where this storm becomes this kind of cellular storm. So, and that's the thing that we're kind of working on now and that is part of the challenge. Um, Oh, next slide. There's a camera reversing out some intestines for a kind of a a, a kind of film noir, slightly um, surreal surrealist kind of moment when it pops out of a tree. So it kind of backs out of the intestines and then kind of reappears back in the forest through a hole in in, in the tree. But we kind of trying... like this ambiguity about like you're not quite sure whether you're in the undergrowth of the forest or you're actually inside the body. So there's moments throughout the whole film where it's making this transition between the forest and the body. Um, and and it is at times like um ambiguous because there is points when when you're going for a gnarly forest anyway it kind of there's points where the forest almost and we shot the whole forest in winter so they almost look like skeletons the trees anyway so they have a very human presence to them so the simulation let's let's go on oh do you want yeah, so this is one of the line. Um, so obviously we've built this narrative with the scientists that we're working with, Martin Pal Palkowski, who I believe might be here tonight. Um, so I hope I pronounced his name right. Um, but one of the lines in the film is their hunger, their health and their pain is felt in my gut and their loss, their loss is mine too. And it's quite a significant line in the film because it's talking about uh, microbial extinction um, and about like this, this blurring of boundaries between um, biomedical health and environmental health Because it, I suppose well. extinction is something that we're very familiar with in an ecological context, but what we're less familiar with in, in terms of how you know we have the same kind of process occurring in our in a kind of gut bacteria and 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 that that is really disrupt disruptive to the immune um, immune system in terms of you know those radical changes to that environment changes how your immune system is able to perceive uh, it, its world and those kind of changes create this this. Uh, disturbance and 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 I suppose what um, is referred to as uh, uh, or things that are referred to like cyt cyt cytokine storms, where it's a, a, an or autoimmune disease, where the immune system is 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 confused and reacting against itself or reacting against um, its host body. Yeah, so it's like an overreaction. Um, so now we're going to talk about the Make a Jam Challenge. Yay! We our, our and we've actually got our bunting up. Yeah, 10 points. Yeah. <laughs> and I've got the sticker on me. Couldn't do any more than that. Um, so that's um, the reason to join the team. <laughs> So um, obviously we've been working on this cytokine storm software for a while, um, but the two kind of questions that we want to pose in our challenge um, that we we would like you to kind of respond to is what might a dysfunctional immune system look like and what are the rules that govern the normal behavior of an immune system and how can they break? Now, I suppose the first question you're gonna have is what is a dysfunctional immune system? So what we've done is we've invited the scientist, Martin, who we've been working closely with to join the Discord session tomorrow night. Um, from half six, we'll be live there. Um, and you can, um, he's going to do like a, um, he's going to discuss things around autoimmune disease, but also hopefully, if I've got this right, Martin, um, like um, a little bit about cytokine storms and overreaction of those as well. Um, Probably far more eloquently than I just did. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, so to just give you a taste of a dysfunctional immune system and, and also, also the connections. Martin is personally really interested in um, microbial extinction. So hopefully he'll talk about that as well. Um, and we've done this kind of starter game. Do you want to sort of Yeah, so this? I mean, so it's very much the starting point that, that, that we took was um, a, a thing called the Game of Life, which is one of it's, it was um, a really kind of early artificial life um, uh, 
system experiment um, thing that was created by someone called John Conway. And um, and we just found out actually he died of COVID last year, which is really sad. Mm. Um, obviously, he was getting on a bit. I think he was in his eighties. But um, yeah, so we almost like see it as a tribute to Conway. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and we, um, we kind of took this as a starting point and we've been um, trying to understand um, the mechanics of the immune system and we've and for the workshops we kind of boiled this down to the probably the most impressive oversimplification of an immune system possible where we literally had four cell types and created a, a, a set of rules that allowed those cells to interact with each other and played around with with those rules to try and create try and create a behavior that could be understood as being a bit like the way that an immune system kind of behaves um, i can't remember what the next slide is uh, it's got some swatches on it, some carpet swatches or something. <laughs> You're all anticipating what the hell that is now. <laughs> but one so, thing I'd like to say about the game of life very quickly is that John um, computed it originally on his kitchen floor. So he had a tiled floor and he used plates to um, compute it. Um, until he got really frustrated with like trampling on the plates and then he moved to paper and checkerboards as well. Um, but like, so we're not like kind of setting this challenge, like you have to do something within a digital domain. You could do something physically as yeah, well, yeah, which we sure. kind of, so we don't want to be pre prescriptive that it has to be digital. But we have prepared a, a kind of a, a, a short tutorial series that kind of takes you from zero to hero but, um, in terms of building a, um, a, a, a immune system so there's uh, it's kind of six kind of tutorial files that use um, processing JS um, which you can use in a browser you don't have to download anything it's really kind of really kind of user friendly and approachable and these kind of take you from absolute beginner to to creating a fully fledged um, a, a immune system in its most incredibly reduced and bored down form and um, if nothing more it creates some um, it might create some interesting wrapping paper um, as you can see here so um, yeah so um, so those resources are, are available and um, and they might be a really interesting kind of jumping off point for anyone that wants to to kind of um, you know approach it from a more of a kind of a coding um, um, perspective. So this is just us running. Um, what you're seeing here now is we're running the game of life rules, but in Godot game engine to create our own like kind of dysfunctional immune system. So that's us. And I just want to say thank you to Martin and Melina, um, who um, have been really helpful, helpful through this whole process. And then hopefully you'll get to meet, if, if you sign up for our challenge, you'll get to meet Martin tomorrow as well in Discord. Okay, thank you. I'll stop sharing our screen. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. Is there an owl outside your window? I can hear an owl. There's a seagull. a seagull, so we've it's got a it seagull. all. <laughs> I, I, I haven't like eaten, so it could be indigestion. <laughs> or... That's brilliant. <laughs> uh, I really enjoyed that. I, my, I have to say, it was a fantastic talk, and my favourite bit, I'm afraid, was when you said, "I don't know what I'm going to say." <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, "Brilliant!" It's like such an honest moment in the talk. I loved it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Cheers. Um, so we move forward. We move on to uh, London and Justine, uh, and I'll let you talk, Justine, and introduce your artists. Hi, everyone. Really, really excited to be here. Uh, I just wanted to apologize to Dominic for not having my bunting up. The reason is I am not in the comfort of my own home because uh, I finished work too late, so I decided to just stick with it and join you all from work. So no bunting. Sorry. Uh, next time, I promise I will have it up. Uh, so I was trying to remember after Matt, you said uh, that you hadn't met Anna yet. Have I met 
Rose and Amanda. I have met Rose once um, in a very dark garden as I was dropping off some materials for a workshop, uh, still when we couldn't go to people's houses. So we were doing it very COVID safe in the dark in the garden. So it still feels like a dream. I don't know if you agree, Rose. I, I don't feel like we've properly met. Uh, but Amanda, I haven't had the pleasure yet, hopefully very soon. Uh, so I'm Justine. I'm an independent curator and freelance producer based in London. I'm French, as you can probably hear. Uh, and I'm the uh, producer for the public engagement in London, and I've been working with artists Baum and Leahy, so Amanda Baum and Rose Leahy, for a few months now, and it's been a, an absolute pleasure. Um, so I just wanted to say a few words to contextualize uh, the work that we've been doing. So from at very much at the heart of Baum and Leahy's approach is um, a concern to help nurture a sense of wonder towards the body and the human body, and to make the cutting edge science of the human cell atlas more accessible to lay people on an intellectual and emotional level. And really having gone through this journey with us, I have myself walked the walk and it has been quite a transformative experience personally. So I feel very, um, I feel very happy for people who are going to join their team, our team, um, that maybe you'll be able to go on that journey in a more contained uh, way over a week. But um, I recommend, I very much recommend it. Um, so as the London team, our brief was to engage with diverse communities in Southwark, in South London. So it's a big borough in the South of London. And we zoomed into one particular area in it, which is called Peckham. And Peckham is a very culturally diverse neighborhood where religion, community, and art are very prominent. So it felt like a really ripe place for us to, to do the work in a really meaningful way. We were. From the beginning, we were really trying to respond to the location in quite a meaningful way. So we did a bit of research as to who lives there and who they are. And, um, and really that has made us realize that uh, because the neighborhood is, the religion is such an important thing in the neighborhood, this is something that we really should be, um, should be looking at. Um, so this, uh, this concern for the location, uh, concern, you know, this care for the location, I would say, actually, uh, led us to want to question how would the science of the HCA, and in particular the reliance on tissue and organ donation, how would that sit with different cultures and beliefs? So to put it shortly, how do we really try and triangulate art, science, and spirituality, what might come out of that? And how do we do that in a way that's respectful, sensitive, and really not appropriating of someone else's culture as well? So one way we've done that is that we put together a panel of local people with expertise in spiritual and health rituals to discuss these ideas with us. And we partnered them from the beginning with, with HCA members. So what was really nice is that everybody was brought together on, on an equal footing. So uh, included in our, in our panel, we had a former GP who now runs a yoga studio. And we also had a really active local vicar who, uh, who's, who worked with us and, and, and discussed the ideas with us. Uh, we've hosted two amazing public workshops where we invited community members to reconnect with their selves, but also to, to make a pause really and take the time to explore their own gut reactions to the science of the human cell atlas as it is shaping up now, but also trying to take them on a journey to think about the different possible futures of cellular biology at large. And again, how does that sit with you? How does that sit with all of us? So, as I said, it's been really great to be able to bring together um, HCA members and community participants on an equal footing. And what, we're really excited to be able to bring in some new voices, your voices, into the mix. So we see you obviously as makers with great skills, but also please come in as people, come in as yourselves with your diverse experiences, your backgrounds, your beliefs, bring all of that into the mix because this is really what we are uh, interested in. Um, so that's it for me, and I will now hand over to Amanda and Rose. Thank you, Justine. Uh, I'm just going to try and share only a portion of my screen. Ooh, some speaker notes coming into the picture there. Is this okay? Can you all see? That looks good now. Yeah. It's not too, uh, too small. I'm just going to move this here. So hello everyone, uh, I'm Amanda and Rose uh, Baum and Leahy and we're really excited to be here and look forward to meeting you all on Discord over the next eight days. 
We are artists who work uh, often work in collaboration with scientists across media, such as interactive installation, scenography, and public engagement to open up question and sensorialize scientific research into tactile and participatory experiences. Uh, at the core of our practice is collaboration with each other uh, and also with specialists in both creative and scientific fields. Our work is really driven uh, by the potentials found in symbiosis on all scales from the personal and the biological. So using this collaborative approach, we hope to enact the power of the multitude uh, and complexity of the ecological dynamics that we're uh, engaging in. In these spaces, we create scenarios that we say meld between the feasible and the fantastical to try and open up uh, spaces where people can engage with these scientific theories and themselves be encouraged to imagine, question and speculate uh, to make sense of uh, the scientific research as something relevant and accessible to them. So one thing that we're particularly interested in is the sensorial and how this can be included uh, in ceremonial acts as a way of engaging in ecological subjects in very intimate and also immediate ways. So some examples of how we've previously used this in our work, um, in our performances and in interactive works, um, uh, works such as this, like uh, called Phenoculus, which was an ant pheromone inspired sound helmet. Uh, this was the first piece that we, we made when we met and the beginning of us exploring these sensory worlds. And also in the algal drinks in a piece called The Red Nature of Mamalda, which brought together people to celebrate seaweed and all of its uh, healing potentials. As well as the jasmine scented mist in a piece called Host and the fungal tea uh, in a piece called Sink and also in spirulina agar agar jellies in a project called Microbia. Um, and so these, uh, yes, and also in this piece, the uh, tactile experience of having this uh, face mask, this was a postal kit in a piece we did recently um, and sent people these little tactile uh, face masks that they could wear to have a sort of altered sensory experience as they listen to the work. So we're really interested in how we can get people involved in the work by getting them to consume or become part of the installation in some way and how this can create a blurring between the boundaries of the bodies of the materials and the space that they're in and how we can imagine that the participants somehow become woven into the artwork. So yeah, we are, we are so grateful to be uh, working on artists uh, on a project like the Human Cell Atlas, uh, which is, you know, will impact all of us, not just scientific communities, but all layers of society from the personal to the societal and planetary. Uh, so starting with this brief to explore normality and tissue donation research within the context of the Human Cell Atlas, we've been on an incredible and uh, I think we can also say quite a dizzying journey sometimes into this huge complex scientific endeavor. Um, starting as many of you participants might do with basic questions like what is tissue, what are cells? And then how will our lives change when a deeper and more expansive knowledge of cellular bi biology becomes a new normal, uh, partly enabled by a project like the Human Cell Atlas and which kinds of new systems will then emerge as a result of this research. The mapping um, of the workings of our inner cellular worlds uh, is a historical moment in time, and we see it as crucial to nurture also the intellectual and emotional and ethical questions that arise alongside these uh, quite rapid scientific developments. And some of the ways we're exploring this for our project, uh, we hope that you will find inspiring and that you will, uh, some of you might join us for the Make a Gem challenge. So we'll just speak about some of that work. Yeah, so we've been using mainly, looking at how different frameworks of, um, of different ceremonies 
can act as entry points to explore the vast research of the human cell atlas and the ethical questions and societal impacts that it brings up. Our uh, research, as Justine mentioned, has been around, centered around connecting with people who practice ceremonies, um, both spiritual and secular. Um, we're interested in how ritual and ceremony can frame both the normal, the everyday, but also the monumentous, and how this space sort of offers up uh, a moment of focus or appreciation that can enable processing and reflection on these emotional subjects. And so some of the questions that we've been thinking about as artists that have been uh, sort of brought into this really fascinating research is what does this scientific encounter with our bodies as cells mean on an emotional existential level? How can we create maps that reflect a sense of wonder, enchantment and respect to our, towards our own bodies? And can we learn from rituals, ceremonies and beliefs across cultures to help us navigate this new landscape of mapped bodies? So in our advisory panels and uh, actually in, this is an image from one of our advisory panels that, that we held. Um, and through our work in this uh, and conversations with the scientists and with the participants um, and in the workshops we've been doing, we've been exploring this theme of ritualistic and ceremonial practices. Our first public workshop um, was designed, was called Mapping Ourselves, Ourselves. And Participants were introduced to the science of the human cell atlas before being invited to create their own version of a human cell atlas, which we called their own body map. Um, and we were encouraging people to draw on their own experiences and beliefs and memories and dreams uh, to create these maps and thinking about what, what a map includes. We were really interested uh, in this counter mapping movement that we got into researching, which questions ways in which you map the world and how this can be done in a way that allows for a multitude of narratives to coexist and become mutually enriching, I guess, alongside one another. And as a way to personalize the human cell atlas science, we found this mapping approach very valuable. And so this could be a possible theme that people could explore within their Make Jam projects. How are we doing on time? Just to, is it okay? Are we all right? You're We're still good, you're good. Um, Thank you. You, have, uh, you have five minutes. Okay. So we but you don't need to fill it if you also don't. Okay, don't no, no, we have, a, yeah, we, okay, have word, we have to work. So, um, Leading up to our second public workshop, we hosted a, a short time travel luncheon where we invited uh, some of the Human Cell Atlas members to imagine the legacy of cellular biology in 2120, so 99 years into the future. And uh, we were quite amazed with how uh, the scientists were able to come up with some pretty wild speculative uh, scenarios, one being a world where organic tissue uh, would make up surrounding materials around us. One spoke about new forms of therapy, therapy using uh, physical forces such as light. And then there are, of course, quite a few of them imagining these uh, more technolo technology focused um, systems of human machine symbiosis. So this meeting informed and inspired our second public workshop in which we explored multiple possible futures uh, shaped by this research. And we send out these little uh, postal kits to the participants, which contained uh, small, mostly handmade uh, objects for the different sensory interactions. And uh, in the workshop, participants were then guided to place these on the cellular sanctum map. Uh, the smell uh, on top of the smell uh, or the odors receptor symbol and so on and then they were invited on three meditative journeys initiated through a sensory interaction to different possible future scenarios um, and to give you a sense one told the story of tissue donation 
communion. Uh, it was initiated by collective eating of seaweed. Mm. And one uh, was this small wax pebble object uh, that was, we had made a speculative scenario about it, connecting you to past and future generations. And in the third scenario, which was initiated by smelling uh, the scent of wet earth, uh, it told the story of a universal cell atlas revealing our bodies as entwined with our local and planetary ecosystems. And um, yeah, we really enjoyed this collective ceremonial space that was created and the conversations uh, that arose from it. Um, the science-based meditations and future speculations seem to kind of open up people's uh, imagination about this. And we hope to explore this further with you uh, for the Maker Jam. And then these are some very fresh uh, sketches on the final um, artwork, which will in many ways draw on uh, the structure of workshop two. Um, this is a sketch of a digitally animated fluxing shrine, uh, which we envision that invites you to travel through your five senses, discovering your body as an ecosystem of both human and microbial cells. And from this point, travel into different possible futures. And then afterwards, we want people to be able to leave their response um, in text and hopefully create this kind of uh, counter map or complementary map to the human cell atlas, which includes emotional reflections and um, imaginations about what the science can mean on a personal level. So to sum up our project, Cellular Sanctum is aiming to really nurture this sense of wonder towards the human body and to make the cutting edge science of the human cell atlas uh, more accessible on an emotional and um, sensory level. And so as the, um, so for the human cell atlas uh, maker jam, so sorry, for the maker jam, we would like to invite you to uh, consider how these inner responsive landscapes are navigated um, and using the following questions as a, as a starting point. So how can we use our senses as entry points to navigate our cellular bodies? How can we use technology to support encounters with scientific data on an emotional and spiritual level? How can we learn more about and create new ways of engaging in discussions around the donation process that has helped build this new knowledge? And so whether you're working very visually or with systems design or musically or as a storyteller or something really different uh, would be, we'd love to see how you might engage uh, with any of these questions. Um, yes. Fantastic, thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Um, yes, and I, I tasted the seaweed, it was, uh, it was it was interesting <laughs> as, as 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 a taste sensation as far as taste sensations go. Um, brilliant, fantastic talk. Thank you. Um, so I'll move forward because we've got a lot to fit in to a very short space of remaining time, and I want to leave space for questions. Um, this is the bit where I put a different hat on actually, because you know, it doesn't kind of quite fit on my headphones. I'm uh, I'm actually also the um, the producer a producer uh, in Newcastle. Um, and I'm wearing a number of hats for the uh, One Cell at a Time engagement project. Um, I'm delivering the Maker Jam. I'm uh, also producing a series of zines about the uh, all of the uh, commissions. And I am uh, working as a producer, working with artist Stacey Pitsilides as well. Um, and uh, Stacy's project has been absolutely uh, an amazing project to be part of. Uh, Stacy's uh, had uh, a really, she's got a really uh, interesting and sensitive approach to a subject, uh, and it's been fascinating to watch your interactions with others through um, the online workshops that we delivered. Uh, just in terms of how uh, she delivers and discusses subjects that aren't part of people's day-to-day -day conversations, I guess, uh, talking about donation. Uh, not just donation of uh, tissue, but uh, medical data as well, as having a really uh, important uh, role to play in all of this. So it's been absolutely fascinating to, to witness. Um, it's one of the things that Stacey will do, and this is, I'm a bit like Catherine, actually, I'm trying to be really careful not to um, 
not to give the game away before the artist actually speaks, before Stacy speaks. And but one of the things that we've been doing, and I'll be careful not to show the my address side of this envelope, or some of you probably have it on stamped address envelopes. Anyway. Um, you can't see this because not, it's kind of appearing and disappearing. Uh, these envelopes with these amazing packages that Stacy has been making for people to work with as well. So I think Stacy might share some of that, if not. But I do want to just share this one thing that I haven't shared with Stacy yet. Which this is, I wonder if this is going to work. Yeah, it's brilliant. Kind of smiley face that somebody sent us. I'll, I'll get that to you. And um, I haven't actually, I hadn't met Stacy uh, up until quite recently when we had a few uh, similar to just doing some garden visits uh, where we kind of kind of looked at each other bewildered, like not used to seeing anybody in three dimensions anymore um, and kind of handed over material and then I kind of scurried off again. Uh, but it was it was really uh, fascinating just to actually meet uh, Stacy as well. Um, I'll hand over to Stacy now and let Stacy talk about her project. So over to you, Stacy. I will unmute myself first so I don't forget to do that. And then I will share screen. I presume you can see that all right, Dominic? Cool. Um, so the commission is called Donate My Body, Bequeath My Data. And I've kind of taken a different approach to this presentation to some of the other speakers. So hopefully you'll run with me and we'll we'll see where this takes us, this journey. First of all, as the others have done, I'm sort of going to share a little bit about my work and my processes. So I'm a design researcher. My work explores themes of creativity, technology, and death and dying. So um, from the very beginning of my research, it's been about questions of what happens to our data and objects after we die, and how do we use them in ways to honor and explore who our loved ones were and what they mean to us. So the first project I wanted to share with you a little bit is called Material Legacies, and it explores collaborations with hospices and the way that bereaved create a curatorial and narrative approach to legacy that focuses on drawing digital and physical things into dialogue with craft technology and design. And you'll see this is a theme running through kind of all the work in some ways, this kind of overlap between technological futures, technological thinking, design, and kind of this theme of death and dying. So on the right, you have these kind of ceramic vessels which are using projection mapping to show the animated story of someone's biography through trains, just to give you an example. But I won't go into so much depth for the others. And these are some of the documentation films that showed the processes of making that were interwoven into the exhibition. This was a collaboration with the Hospice of St. Francis. And we worked together with bereaved makers to explore these kind of personal experiences of loss and how they wove into a public exhibition, which aimed to expand that knowledge out into the world and aim to give you each room being the experience of a person. So as you move through the rooms. Um, I then wanted to chat to you a little bit about something called the Death Positive Libraries, which is an ongoing project that has actually run since 2018. So it's a fairly long project and it's been in many different forms. So there's been performative stuff, there's been graphic stuff, there's been communications, there's been digital stuff. And I'm just going to give you a little taste of that because I don't want to take too much time doing this. But it's a collaboration between Redbridge, Newcastle and Kirklees Libraries. And it aims to kind of explore how their policies of creating healthy, caring cities and giving people access to end of life choices can be examined through this idea of death positivity. So death positivity is not so much about um, bereavement or care or those kind of things, but about exploring mortality and opening that up as a topic and an area and a theme of interest. Um, it explores how social shifts of death are represented within physical and digital environments, ritual practices, education and entertainment. And these are our love after death pods that we're traveling across these library spaces and allow people to come in and explore these collections of tickets for the afterlife. So these tickets for the afterlife um, collided um, the past rituals of death and dying with current, present, future and far future rituals. So by bringing those things together in new spaces, they created these mediating objects that allowed people to think through what these rituals practices mean for their day to day lives. So everything from kind of cloning a new body to merging your DNA with the tree through to kind of butterfly releases and memorial benches and things that are more kind of tangible objects all the way through to kind of 
um, the way that data might be used to reanimate the human being and these kind of immortality and transhumanist approaches. And those things are really about helping people to scrutinize also these technologies and the development of them. So in terms of privacy and what is the meaning of bodies? So all these things are sort of themes that run across the work. And they were installed in a range of different festivals as well. So this is the Day of the Dead Festival at Redbridge Library. It was also in Futurefest. It went to the Toronto TO Design Festival um, for the Dying Dialogue series. So it's sort of been around. And now as part of the COVID, um, you know, changing everything plans that has happened across COVID, we've been building an interactive app, which is a kind of quiz, which allows you to navigate these different spaces. So trying to figure out and aims to give you different options and, you know, help you select a ticket for the afterlife. And then as part of that process also gives you a book recommendation that you can borrow in your library if you happen to be in Newcastle, Kirklees or London, Redbridge. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this commission and then move straight into the maker challenge because that's sort of what I wanted to spend a bit more time with on this presentation. So something that really interested me was that right in the middle of kind of COVID from spring 2020, the law around organ donation in the UK changed. That changed in a way that it became an opt out rather than an opt-in. So the way that people used to carry around organ donor cards and make sure that people knew that they were organ donors completely shifted this form of sort of, well, everybody's an organ donor. And actually in order to not be an organ donor, you have to tick an NHS form, which says that you're not an organ donor. And I think that that provided really interesting um, questions. And a lot of the people that we worked with in the focus groups, or not focus groups, but in the kind of workshops and the group environments, didn't actually know that this law had changed. And so certainly in terms of belief and in terms of people's religions and people's different cultural practices and things, this is something challenging sometimes to bring up in discussion and to think about. Um, so what I wanted to do as part of the, this um, HCA commission was to create, as Dominic said, these HCA art packs or kits. Um, they include this kind of accordion folded body form, which has these stimulating questions. Again, it's that kind of mediating object which helps people to think through things. Um, and the fact that they're body forms makes you reflect on that in terms of identity. So they, they have these kind of provocations across them that can let you draw and think and map. Um, and the ones in the Petri dish are more about kind of science and scientific advancement and how we feel about it. And they also were built through a workshop with the HCA scientists, which helped us explore the kind of detail behind some of these things, um, particularly building this kind of glossary of terms, which we help people to understand the difference between organ donation for research, organ donation in other ways, becoming a living donor, um, tissue banks and biobanks and all these kinds of different layers. Um, some of the ideas behind this was also sort of around these old anatomical dolls and the fact that the kind of layering of the human form sat on top of each other. And that theme of layering has sort of transcended a little bit into the challenge. And actually I've become really interested in mapping. So not to kind of, um, take from what uh, the others are doing, but like this has sort of become something that's, that's become really interesting for me. Um, and thinking about the way that we set things out and, you know, this is, this is just a collection of images of the kits as I was being produced because I've produced around 50 or 60 kits till now. So it's been a bit of a workshop um, at home on the desk kind of thing. Um, but yeah, these are some of the examples of the questions that were asked within these kits. So things like, trying to see what people's preference were around trust, around donation and personal data, around saving lives, around helping future generations, um, around different kinds of cells. So getting really to that granular knowledge. So, you know, do we care, you know, is it organs that matter to us? What about a tumor? Is a tumor junk or is it something that can be donated that can have a something really important come out of it in terms of the research? Do reproductive cells feel different for different religions? So thinking about the way the donated tissue um, could be linked to biological samples with personal data and people being worried about research being conducted that was contrary to the values. So I've just, um, compile some of the data into this really, really simple sort of thing. So some of the themes that came up across the workshops were ideas of beliefs, trust and transparency and death and grief. 
um, particularly around some of the rituals around COVID being changed, people talking about people standing on either side of the road as the car procession comes through, people talking about trust and transparency around the track and trace, people talking about beliefs that are different in the cross-generational context. So even though we believe something, what do our family believe? How does our you know, our becoming an organ donor affect those people around us and how those networks come together. So again, sort of linking into those ideas of maps and sort of mapping spaces. Um, and also thinking about what we're kind of building, which is sort of in chrysalis stage. So unfortunately there's not too much to share, but like we're building this interactive um, app that people will be able to explore physically environments and find these geolocated sites that will help them share some aspect of donating themselves into this collective whole for the advocacy of you know science and sort of thinking about what it means to donate a part of myself so giving a part of myself to this new collective whole and that's some of the frames that i wanted to explore so this idea of mapping and space and what that kind of mapping of the body means is something that i wanted to briefly kind of touch on and yeah inspired of course by the human cell atlas and the fact that it is an atlas and those ideas of cartography and space and mapping and the correlations between things particularly also in terms of data so i've just realized there's something missing but i probably have it later down so i apologize for that um so something that i found really interesting is the artist um dustin yellen's work who works with different kinds of psychogeographies of the body. And he uses these kind of um, acrylic resin blocks to kind of build these layers of 3D forms that explore what the body um, could mean or what the body could do or how it's kind of built or different kinds of representations within the body. Um, the artists, Sonia, and Eric, who talk about this idea of cartographies of the body and explore how if you press yourself onto these um, sheets that skin bacteria will grow and use this kind of trace based approach to form different kinds of maps and different ways of exploring how what lives on the body. So what lives on the skin and how that kind of becomes a trace or a mapping function. Um, I was also interested um, in the way that different cultures map health and map the body and this kind of idea of illustration and drawing. So the Ayurvedic man um, encountered with Indian me medicine, which is part of the Welcome Collection. And there's a whole lot of stuff in the Welcome Collection about these different cultural mappings of the body and different cultural mappings of health and medicine. Um, and other kinds of brain maps. So kind of illus using illustration and really simple ways of mapping uh, different emotions, different feelings, different um, approaches to seeing the body interwoven with words and typography. So thinking about those kind of typographic interactions and intersections with the body. Um, so yeah, this was what I was looking for earlier. So the, the as Dominic mentioned, posthumous medical data donation has also been really important to this commission. So the idea that we have a data body that exists alongside our physical body, which in some ways the donation of medical data um, could be very similar to data donate, uh, organ donation. And it could be a way that would support a personalized approach to medical research um, and something which could generate new knowledges of um, you know, medical concerns and stuff. But it comes with some challenges and it comes with some questions. And I wanted to bring in this kind of reference of this film Coded Bias. And if you haven't seen it, it's fantastic. Um, go watch it. But the kind of implicit biases in data sets and the way that we collect data, the way that we aggregate data, the way that we visualize data is all implicitly, there's a, there's a political kind of stance to it. And I think my kind of mapping challenge is sort of, included that sort of political and personal stance towards that data and towards our physical bodies, but also our kind of data bodies. So kind of thinking about how those two things intersect. Um, the Felton reports, I think, are also fantastic. Felton, if you don't know, is a graphic designer who's been mapping all kinds of data about himself for many, many years. It's a personal ongoing project. And uh, this is actually his father's life mapped in data. So it's actually a memorial and a tribute, but a piece of data visualization as well. Um, and Stanza, who have also been doing a really wide body of work 
around um, body data, but also the externalization of something to create a kind of body of data. So this kind of backwards forwards of what body data means and how, you know, the near future and um, our bodies will be alive with data and embedded devices. Well, sort of, they are kind of alive with body data and devices. I would say that future is very much here. So, you know, really thinking about that kind of relationship between those different kinds of bodies. And then also the work of Body Data Space, which is a collective that have produced a lot of work in this area. And this is the installation Collective Realities, which uses flocking and mapping so that people engaging in this physical space without hardware and without wires and stuff can dance and play and touch people. And as they do that, the installation and the interactions change and warp and actually we're collaborating with body data space on this project so that's sort of the next stage of things after this make a jam um, so the challenge to get to that is to explore a personal mapping of the body but to really focus on those internal external and data layers to define an area of interest so for example how breath moves from body to environment. So breath starts, you know, where it starts in the body, it starts maybe in the lungs and it moves up the body and it moves out into the world and sort of those kind of things. To use principles of mapping to form new meanings and correlations, to use the body as a starting point, sensory tool, but to consider how it maps onto territories of belief, trust, transparency, data futures and scientific advancement and to consider the materiality of the map. For example, how sketch or craft or stitch or trace or typographic sonic, sorry, that's my timer going off, data-driven and 3D narrative or locative spaces all come together in this psychogeographic almost approach to seeing the body. So psychogeographic being that combination or that clashing between psychology and geography. So the way that we feel and engage with environments. Um, and I've just got one or two more things to show. And part of this is sort of thinking already, what data do you already collect about yourself? You know, do you collect your runs? Do you map your periods on an app? Do you use um, a sleep monitor? Do you use, you know, what kinds of things, you, your geolocation is being collected? Do you have favorite spots on Google Maps and stuff? So really thinking about that as being a kind of starting point as well. Um, and then part of this, I'm going to use a, a, a mirror board, which is a kind of interactive pin board, I guess you could call it. It's a bit like loads of post-it notes around to create different layers of mapping and allow people to, um, to explore these things with me and to give people some starting points, because I think that's sort of what's needed. So the mirror board is on my Discord channel. And if you'd like to join me for this challenge, I'd love to chat to you some more about this. And I'll explain it further tomorrow evening when we have our session together. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks, Stacey. That was amazing. How do we sign up? How do you sign up to to the um, to the to the each individual artist challenge? Well, I'll share my screen again. So, um, if I can go to this, uh, and please somebody tell me if they can't see it. Uh, can everybody see that? Is that okay? Yeah. Ways of joining in. You should be able to see. Yeah. Great. Um, so. Um, Discord. Well, most of you should have signed up to the Discord by now. It's a very simple uh, interface. You can see down the left-hand side, there's the channels. And the middle is where you type and leave messages. And on the right-hand side, you can see who is in the server, where it says online, and who else has signed up to it but isn't in it. And that's offline down there. Um, what I need you to do is when you pick your challenge, Go into the text channel down the left-hand side, and you'll see each artist group name down the left-hand side. Join that channel and say hello. Just leave, leave your mark uh, and be prepared to meet the artists uh, tomorrow at uh, 6.30, and we'll begin. Um, it's as simple as that, really. Uh, if you've got any questions in the meantime, drop them about each individual challenge, drop them in the channel. Um, and I'll be hovering uh, all of tomorrow, kind of picking up those questions and checking in with people and seeing where we are. So if you've got any questions that need a quick response, uh, message me on the Discord as well. Uh, I think I'm just at Dominic on the Discord. It's as straightforward as that. Um, if you look at the timetable, you'll see when I'll be available for support because it says something along the lines of, uh, 
available for support. Let's have a look at this uh, terrifying timetable we have here. Make a jam project support. That's when I'm guaranteed to be in the uh, Discord. And you can see also um, artists present in their project discussion channels. That's when all the artists will be available to uh, talk to you about the projects, uh, to encourage you and to talk more about what they've been making as well. Um, it's that straightforward. Um, you can form teams. There is a team recruitment channel there. So if you have an idea, but don't feel you have all of the skills you need, form a team and ask for somebody who is there. Likewise, if you have a set of skills, but not sure what you're going to do, let people know and see if they can invite you to their team. And um, you can work individually as well. If you are a closet introvert like me, you can work entirely on your own as well. That is totally allowed. Um, uh, just be aware that we uh, remember that we said we're stretching this out a one day hackathon spread out over the course of a week. So there might be a slight gap between uh, asking questions and getting answers, but we'll try and get to you as soon as we can. Um, and then uh, we will have this grand finale amazing event. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. What we'll do then um, is just start using the Discord. You know, um, I'll kind of hover in there for a bit tonight um, while I'm having my dinner um, and uh, answer any questions that might come to you then as well. And um, yeah, just get cracking, get making, get doing. Uh, and let's see if we can all kind of have a really uh, enjoyable experience over the next week. Um,